Hey friends, today we're going to be going over something that I feel like every single musician, producer, or engineer should be familiar with, and that's how to know whether your music is actually ready to be sent off to a mastering engineer. Hopefully this video will serve as something of a list so you can check off one by one what really matters when it comes to preparing your mixes for mastering. Also, at the end of the video, I'm going to give you some nice tips that'll help make your master come out as best as it can be, so make sure you stick around for that. All right, so first off, in order for all this to sink in, we need to establish what mastering actually is. While there are many different services offered out there, in the most basic sense, mastering covers three main tasks. Number one, reducing the dynamic range or raising the volume of a mix up to broadcast loudness, making it ready for streaming, physical distribution, and so on. Number two is treating the audio itself with EQ, dynamics processing, subtle saturation, and other tools to enhance the mix and make it so the mix sounds similar coming out of different types of audio playback systems. So within reason, a good master should sound about the same coming out of headphones to small speakers to cars to PA systems. This is something that's referred to as translation. Now finally, number three, the mastering engineer changes the file format of the mix to deliverables ready to be ingested by streaming platforms or ready to be sent off to like CD and vinyl duplication. Now this is a simplification of course, but essentially that's a broad overview of what a traditional mastering engineer is doing. So how do you know if your mix is ready? Well, let's dive in. I think one of the most common misconceptions that less experienced musicians and producers have of mastering is that they expect the mastering engineer to work miracles and make huge sweeping changes to their mixes that will make their music sound as perfect as producers that they look up to. But if you consider what I've already mentioned about the mastering engineer's job, they are way more focused on translation and loudness. If you're trying to decide whether your mix is ready for mastering or not, listen up. Your mix should already sound like what you're going for. Or in other words, you don't personally know or can't personally hear how it could sound any better. That's when you're ready to send off for mastering. Now, similarly, another misconception that folks have is that it's the mastering engineer's job to add very apparent loud saturation or huge reverbs to the mix, things that alter the overall vibe of the music. These are actually what I would refer to as creative decisions, and these are very much out of the mastering engineer's wheelhouse. Again, your mix should already sound like what you're going for before you send it off. In my experience working with many different mastering engineers, and in all of the hundreds of projects that I've mastered myself for other people, the changes that pro artists are asking for and what pro mastering engineers deliver are subtle changes. A small 2 dB tweak to this frequency here, a little multiband compressor cut or boost there, a little bus compression. Though there are always caveats and exceptions, the general take is that it's not the mastering engineer's job to super alter your mix or take your Mr. Rogers neighborhood sound and convert it to G Jones or something, right? It's just not that much effect happening, right? The idea is that the mastering engineer's job is using subtle effects to try to make it so that your mix will translate through different types of playback systems. That's the job, all right? Now I should say, even though it is the mastering engineer's job to achieve solid translation, within reason, of your music, I maintain that one of the pillars of whether I know that my music is ready for mastering or not is if I play it out of my headphones and then switch to my monitors or my car or my Bluetooth speaker, that there isn't a huge shocking difference to how the mix sounds. There might be a right-brained temptation there to make a total mess of your mix so that you can have somebody else come and clean it all up. But there's only so much a mastering engineer can do, especially if you're sending a stereo mix down. Think about it. If a single track in your mix has entirely too much of some certain frequency, then the mastering engineer will have to adjust for that frequency. And of course, that's going to affect all the other instruments and sounds at that same frequency. Okay, so the next thing is that you've received and listened to feedback from other producers that you respect. The whole reason mastering is such a powerful thing is because the mastering engineer has something that you can never have. It's a thing I like to call objectivity. Unlike you, they've never heard your mix. Meanwhile, you've heard your mix one trillion times. And what happens when you listen to the same thing over and over and over again is that eventually you normalize your weird decisions that you've made. This happens to everyone. Beginners and pros alike can get used to their mix to the degree that they can't hear problems that are immediately obvious to other people. 
Also, if you're like most bedroom producers, your studio likely has playback issues, such as room modes and a non-linear response coming out of your headphones, convincing you to make bad decisions that might be immediately obvious to someone else in a different room. Essentially, what I'm getting at here is you need to utilize your community and get feedback from other producers and do the same thing for them. Because the feedback that they give you is potentially the most valuable thing that you can get. As part of my Ableton Online courses, we have a super engaged feedback section in our Discord where we're giving each other detailed feedback on our mixes, and folks in my Ableton course community consider the feedback section to be one of the things that they value the most in the whole experience. I have personally never sent a mix off to a mastering engineer without consulting at least one other person, and it's not just because I get that all-powerful feedback, but because simply playing your music for other people makes you want it to be the best thing that you can make. It's crazy how problems in your mix jump out at you the moment you start thinking about playing that music for other people. Now in a similar vein, if you're trying to decide if your mix is ready for mastering or not, consider this. When you yourself approach your studio and listen to your mix with fresh ears, you shouldn't immediately feel the urge to go into your mix and start fixing things. You should, for the most part, be able to listen all the way through and consider it the best of your ability at the time that you made it. If you are a true artist, likely this will be one of the hardest things to do, to call anything finished. But the criteria is specific for a purpose. Ask yourself, is this truly the best that I can do with this mix? And if you can answer yes within reason, it's ready. Okay, so as promised, here are some tips for you to consider when sending your mix off to mastering. First of all, you don't need to send music at a specific level to the mastering engineer. I've seen many different numbers tossed around on forums and even here on YouTube. This is likely a relic from a very long time ago when we were mixing and mastering to tape and noise floor was a huge concern. No matter what anyone else tells you, just make sure that the mix isn't audibly distorting because of clipping and make sure that you leave some dynamic range for the mastering engineer to work with. If you send off a negative 8 LUFS or louder mix to a mastering engineer, they won't have much range to work with and you're not going to get the best possible result. Another misconception that I've been seeing is that you need to send your mix to the mastering engineer without any plugins on the master track. This is total nonsense. You can send a mix to a mastering engineer with whatever effects on your master track that you want. Much of the time, effects on the master track provide character and vibe to the music. EQs are okay, saturators are okay, compressors are okay if they're used lightly, and even occasionally limiters can be used, especially if they add something creative to the music that you're trying to achieve. But just like I said, at the end of the day, final loudness is the mastering engineer's job. So don't send a super hyper-compressed mix to the mastering engineer, you're just not gonna get the best result. Now, another thing that can help get your mix ready is to add a temporary limiter to your master track during the mixing process and see how loud the limiter can get your tune to be before significant distortion or artifacts. Now, common loudness targets for streaming platforms are around negative 14 LUFS. You can grab some free plugins that have an LUFS meter in the case that the limiter that you use doesn't have one, such as Ableton's limiter, for example. Now you can do a test. If you can't turn the music up to negative 14, negative 12, negative 10, or whatever your loudness target is without the limiter having to work really, really hard, then chances are the mastering engineer is gonna have to do some drastic editing to your mix to get to the loudness target. You can essentially use a limiter to show you which tracks or sounds are fighting the limiter, and you can go in and adjust them at the track level. Once it's easy to crank the track up to your loudness target, you can disable the limiter and send the file off to mastering. Doing this is going to make the mastering engineer's job a lot easier, and of course the end result is going to be the best possible master that you can get. Now, if you find yourself struggling to get to your loudness target, commonly you'll find that it's too much low end in the mix that's causing your limiter to struggle to reach that target. Now, potentially you're feeling a little overwhelmed because a lot of this stuff feels advanced and technical, and yeah, to a large degree it is, but I offer a very robust set of Ableton online courses that can really help you achieve mixes that sound pro and stand up to any other modern mix. In fact, I have a free little webinar that you can watch over here where I go over the skills that I feel are most important for achieving pro results with Ableton. So if you like my teaching style, you can watch this webinar in the link below, and I'll give you some extremely handy skills that I'm sure you're going to end up using for the rest of your mixing life. Anyway, as always, thanks for watching, everybody. If you like this kind of thing, like, comment, subscribe. Much love. See you next time.